Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to an all new Talkin' Movies. As always, I am your host, the real Gino, Gina Reynolds, and today we've got a bit of a Marvel, not so Marvel double feature for you. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Once Upon a Deadpool and Spider Man Into the Spider Verse. First, we're going to talk about the movie that, well, technically everybody's seen Once Upon a Deadpool. Uh, what this is, it's basically a PG-13 version of Deadpool 2 with a little bit of a storytelling element uh, put into it. Uh, the basic gist of the story is Deadpool has kidnapped Fred Savage and he's tied him up to the bed uh, of a similar, pretty similar uh, setup to The Princess Bride. And it's him telling him the story of Deadpool 2, but in a friendlier manner. Now, this movie, if it wasn't trying, or also if it wasn't uh, doing what it's doing by giving some of the money to charity, I would have called this a cash grab. Um, and I still kind of do call it a cash grab, but... I, I, I'm giving it a little bit of credit because, again, it's giving money to charity and it did try to do something new with the storytelling element. Uh, the problem I had with this movie was it's... I had a lot of problems with this movie, to be honest. Uh, first, the Fred Savage stuff is kind of funny, but it's not so funny that it warrants a theatrical release. Um, and... I say this because while I did find humor in the segments, the humor is pretty obvious. Uh, it's nothing really new. You kind of expect... Basically, Fred Savage calls out Deadpool and, Dead, and the movie Deadpool 2 for uh, its shortcomings. A lot of stuff that people have said in comments about uh, not covering the history of Cable or... Uh, using the phrase lazy writing to cover up lazy writing and just all sorts of stuff like that. And there's also some Princess Bride jokes in there as well. And again, it's fine, but this is something along with the PG-13 cut that I just would have put on the first Blu-ray release. Uh, I think it would have been a very cool release, and I've always said they should do a PG-13 release just as kind of a joke, and that's kind of what this is. It makes fun of itself being PG-13, and they bleep out. Uh, you know, Deadpool has a, a beeper, and he bleeps out F-bombs and stuff like that, and sometimes in the movie it gets bleeped out, and they have to pixelate some nudity like whenever they show... Uh, Deadpool with baby legs and you kind of see him do the, the basic instinct leg crossing thing so that's all it is it's, it's them making this movie less of what it is and it does not warrant a theatrical release and I just see here's, here's my biggest problem with it okay now and they do joke about Disney uh, owning Marvel are going to be owning Fox now because they have this whole we're Marvel. No, well you're not. You're, you're Marvel with Fox. Well, Fox is owned by Disney. It's the the jokes are pretty. It's what you expect. And what it got me thinking was, okay, they get a lot. They get away with a lot of cuss words in this movie. And, you know, they do take out all the f bombs and everything. Uh, but a lot of the other stuff's still in there. Um, you can tell where they've changed things uh, with ADR and things like that, and it's it's pretty noticeable. But a lot of the other cursing and everything's in there. I mean, it's PG-13. You can get away with a lot with the PG-13 nowadays. And I could see if when, once Disney gets a hold of this, they're not even going to let them get away with that. If they go PG-13 uh, with Deadpool. So it kind of gives you a, a, a somewhat a, of a peek into the future of Deadpool. If they go PG-13 if Disney decides to do that. And I got to say I don't like what I'm seeing. And here's the reason why. If, if this would have been offered up first. 
uh, and and I'll and I'll use the end credit scenes as an example, uh, because the same end credit scenes are still there, uh, plus a couple more with Fred Savage, and honestly, they're okay. Um, but when it comes to the end credit scenes, them being less violent, and I am referring to the uh, Weapon Eleven part and the Green Lantern part, them being less violent, just takes away from the effect of them now if this was the first time you've ever seen them you might find them pretty funny because you haven't seen the ultra violent versions of them the ultra violent versions uh are definitely something for the fans uh you know wasting weapon 11 and then wasting ryan reynolds for reading the green lantern script and thinking it's gonna you know shoot his career through the roof so seeing the less lesser versions of them are just kind of it takes away from it and i just feel that this whole pg-13 takes away from the whole thing because we've already been given the r-rated version and i just feel that this version while i would say definitely check it out uh don't expect magic don't expect some miraculous new deadpool movie out of this it's a pg-13 version of deadpool 2 with a few cut-ins added in and that's about it so i'd say check it out but again don't expect this new deadpool movie that a lot of us were actually kind of expecting now the next movie we're going to be talking about is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. This is Sony's uh, animated take on Spider-Man um, after the uh, the movie that was Venom. Um, this movie is, uh, thankfully, I mean, yes, it has Peter Parker in it, but they're taking a new spin. They're doing the Miles Morales story, which... This being a an origin movie, I'm okay with. Uh, the story is basically Maz Morales uh, gets bit by a spider, and I can't even say it's a radioactive one. I would say it's a glitching one. Um, it's it's hard to explain without giving away the plot. Uh, but he, after this happens, he stumbles upon. Uh, Spider-Man fighting uh, the Green Goblin uh, and then in turn uh, against the Kingpin and something happens to Spider-Man and uh, Miles Morales witnesses this and uh, he promises Spider-Man that he will finish the mission. Um, uh, He has to stop the, uh, the Kingpin from using this big uh, time space dimensional machine uh, for a very uh, it's a plot the kingpin's uh, reasons for doing this are kind of a little out there but to get all the other spider people in he kind of has to do it uh, but Miles Morales promises he's going to stop him and all of a sudden another Spider-Man shows up and starts to teach Miles uh, reluctantly uh, how to be Spider-Man and then some other spider people show up. Um, long story short, let me just drop a message to Sony. Um, Sony, drop everything you're doing in the live action department and focus on animation. Uh, I love this movie um now i will say this uh this movie is a little all over the place style wise but it's supposed to be uh this movie its story is is in some ways complicated in some ways very simplistic but it works uh i love all the characters in the movie uh so that definitely helps when you like who you're watching Um, but we'll start with the art style. Um, when I first saw the trailer, uh, for this movie, the art style didn't really impress me. I didn't really give it much of a chance. Uh, but then I saw some more pictures and another trailer and I started to get sold on it. I kind of saw what they were doing. They were going, uh, for a comic book feel, uh, for the main world of this movie. And, 
you know, I'll, I'll put it like this. Do you remember when Motion Comics came out and you thought it was a great idea until you saw them? Uh, the animation was choppy. The voice acting was terrible. Well, this movie is really honestly what you would want Motion Comics to be. Uh, the art style just screams, hey, we're a comic book and it's really cool. Uh, there'll be times that word bubbles will pop up like whenever Miles is thinking. Uh, there are times where they'll zoom in close and you can almost see dots uh, like he's been printed on a page. Uh, like whenever they show him real up close and everything. Um, so there's all sorts of just comic book feels when, when people hit different things. Like when they'll punch bad guys, the words will pop up on the screen just little things like that. The the art style of this, uh, if you give it a chance, it's fantastic. It takes a little while to get used to because there's times where parts of the screen feel blurry and it's hard to really explain why or why this is, but it's just sometimes the parts of the screen feel blurry, but you, you get used to it after a while and you focus on the main characters and everything uh, really works out art-wise. Uh, when it comes to the performances, uh, Shamik Moore, I loved him as Miles Morales, uh, really, and I can't say anything bad about any of the voice performers, uh, Jake Johnson as, uh, Peter Parker, um, and I'll just say there is more than one Peter Parker, uh, I'll let you guys find out who the other one is, um, I, I loved Haley Steinfeld as, uh, Gwen Stacy, uh, it's funny that she was in this movie because I saw Bumblebee, uh, the same night or the same day. So uh, I saw two Haley Steinfeld movies in one day. Uh, and I didn't even know that because I didn't know she was Gwen Stacy. I didn't do a lot of research into this. Uh, Mahersha Ali is uh, Uncle Aaron. And if you've read uh, the newer Ultimate Spider-Man uh, comic books when Miles took over, uh, you know who Uncle Aaron is. Um, and I really liked him. He's he, Let's just say... He has a job um, that that Miles doesn't know about. Um, Lily Tomlin is Aunt May, who's great. Uh, uh, John uh, Mulaney is Spider Ham. I love Spider Ham. Um, I've always loved the comics and just the idea and the absurdity of it. Uh, he's very Looney Tunes uh, in this, and, and I I thought it was fantastic. Uh, he even drops a line that they have to comment about trademarks uh, on, and I loved it. Uh, Kamiko Glenn, who is from Orange is the New Black, uh, she's Penny Parker. Uh, Penny is very anime, and that's something you'll notice with these characters. They all have different styles. Penny is anime. Uh, Spider-Ham, again, is very Looney Tunes. Uh, you know, Miles and Peter are just kind of straight-up comic book uh, then you have Nicolas Cage as Spider Noir, um, and he's just, I mean, he feels like he's been ripped off a black and white noir book, you know. There's just all sorts of characters like that, and they all have their different styles, and they're all fantastic, and they all do a great job voice acting. Um, Lee Schreiber as uh, the Kingpin, um, he gets to play a very New York Kingpin, and he's the very larger than life i mean ridiculously large man type of kingpin you know absurdly strong um and he's kind of frightening at times in this movie and i thought he did a great job now granted he wouldn't be able to play that character in real life i don't think i mean don't get me wrong i think leaf schreiber could pull it off somehow uh with but he, they'd have to you know doctor him up with effects and things like that but in animated form he's fantastic uh, and then you also get to see new spins on characters like Scorpion and Green Goblin and especially Doc Ock. Uh, it's, it was kind of surprising what they do with Doc Ock, but I actually really liked it. I liked to uh, play Doc Ock and I just liked the performance. It was different. Uh, it's not what you're expecting, but it works really well. Uh, when it comes to the story, um, while the main story is the... Uh, origin story of Miles Morales as the new Spider-Man, uh, everyone else kind of gets an origin story as well. You have Jake Johnson's Peter Parker has an origin story. The other Peter Parker has an origin story. And it's not 
they're cramming this the whole movie. It's just, hey, here's a quick update to what the origin story is. Because we all know when it comes to Spider-Man, and especially Peter Parker, we don't need another origin story. So everyone kind of gets uh, little bits of origin stories told in kind of like comic book form. And those are really cool. Uh, when it comes to the action, the action is great in this movie. The effects are great in this movie. I, I really can't say enough good things about this movie. I don't have a lot of complaints. Uh, I heard some people complain and they thought it was too long. I didn't feel that whenever I saw it. Lastly, uh, if this or there is two more things. Uh, first, uh, there is a Stanley cameo um, and just hearing his voice and even seeing him in animated form, just hearing that voice was, it, it still hurts. Uh, I still miss him and I'm going to forever miss that guy. So anytime I see him, uh, in anything, uh, you know, I just, it's going to hurt, but he's in it and it's fantastic to see him and hear his voice in it. And also there is an after credit scene, uh, which I will not spoil, um, I will say that they were saying at the screening I went to that they had to confiscate a camera from someone from another screening because they tried to sneak it out. Uh, they were really wanting to keep it secret. So I'll just say this about the after credits scene. Uh, it not only teases the future of this animated franchise, but it's also freaking hilarious. So definitely uh, stay for the end credits to check that out. Um, and I forgot to mention, uh, during, uh, the end of once upon a Deadpool, there is, uh, something about Stanley at the end of those credits too. So definitely check those out as well. Uh, anyway, that's going to be all for this, uh, Marvel, not so Marvel double feature. I hope you guys have enjoyed these reviews as always. I am your host, the real Gino, Gino Reynolds. If you like what you've heard here, please subscribe to the real Gino YouTube channel. Like this video. And if you have anything to say about either of these movies, make sure to feel free to leave a comment in the section below until next time. See you later.